Coming up, we have a Tempest shootout, sort of. I play some games, and I continue with my pretend business. Let's get on then. Tempest was released into the arcade by Atari in 1981 and uses vector graphics to depict the action, much like Asteroids or Black Widow and other Atari vector games. The player moves around the outer edge of various shaped tunnels and has to destroy the aliens as they move closer. You have a super zapper that can destroy all aliens and also some levels has you dodging spikes as you head off for the next tunnel. The arcade cabinet used a spinner to control the player which works brilliantly with this style of game, but would mean any home conversions would have to work out how to replicate that control. This is one of the games I head for whenever I see one at an event. I love playing this game, and the vectors are superb, and hard to mimic on 8-bit machines with low resolutions. Sound 2 is iconic, and the Spectrum will find it difficult to get even close to this. The Spectrum did get an official release, but before we look at that, let's check out some of the competition. First up is The Guardian from PSS, released in 1983. This game has a great cover, much like other early PSS titles, but onto the game then, and it's not actually too bad. You get the initial tunnel with aliens heading up, you move around the outside and shoot. Control is very sensitive though, meaning that it's sometimes difficult to line up your shots, which is important in the game. Sound is used really well, the Spectrum was never going to reach the arcade standards, but this does a decent job. The Super Zapper in this game looks really good. There's a slight change in gameplay between levels, in that you have to dodge asteroids. This is an annoying section, and there's no real reason for it. Your ship moves too fast as well, so it's usually a matter of luck if you get past this bit. Tunnels look good, but again the Spectrum is never going to get the resolution of the arcade, but they work well. Sadly, they're always square though, so there's no variety. next game is Exodus. This game was going to be released by Rabbit Software and called The Pit, but they went bust and the game was picked up by Firebird. The idea is to stop anything escaping from the pit, apart from a character called Spud. However, you don't know what he looks like yet until you've played him and shot him. Most of the items coming out of the pit, if you can't manage to shoot them, are okay to let past. Apart from the llama, and you have to shoot this at all costs. This is starting to sound like a Jeff Minter game, but it was actually written by John Kane, the same author as Booty. The player moves very smoothly around the outer edge, and is easy to control. The enemies are solid sprites with minimal animation, and the sound is quite nice. If you look closely, you'll see a Commodore sign in there as well. There are different pits to clear, and to do this you have to kill 50 enemies in the time limit. The only problem is that you can't see the sprites when they're very small, which means you can accidentally hit Spud. A tough task, so a little poke will help us see the other pits. The second one is a diamond, the same gameplay as here, and eventually the game grows on you. It's obviously slower than Tempest, but still difficult. Pit number three is a large square, and again it has the same gameplay. Not a bad game, but I think it moves too far away from Tempest.
Next we have Shockwave, a game I've never heard of before, released by Impulse in 1983. Oh dear. This looks like a basic game. The layout looks nice, but the control is so slow. The movement is in jumps. I mean, there is some gameplay here, but not much. This is definitely basic because you can break into it, but it does have some nice effects like the large writing. Each level has a set number of aliens to kill before you move on. The second level is in space, but it's the same game, but just without the grid. Once that's complete, it's back to the first grid again. As the aliens appear, they will slowly change colour, and if they get to yellow, they'll head towards your ship and destroy it. Let's move on then. Next we have Tempest from Microgen, released in 1983. Oh, what the hell? I think they've tried to make Tempest side on, and it's not really working. It's a very early game and you can tell. Not much in the way of instruction, so just shoot anything really. The magenta boxes leave trails, and there are some weird cyan beams about it. No idea what they do. If you get far enough, your ship heads off to the right hand side, and at this point this is where you have to avoid those yellow trails. Control is okay, but gameplay is definitely not Tempest. Moving on, and another game called Tempest, this time by EMM, also released as GeForce by Eurobyte in 1983. Okay, so it's a vertical version of Tempest then. Nice sound though. I think it's just a case of flooding the screen with bullets. There's too much on screen to aim for really. Control works well, but the amount of things make it quite difficult. If you progress, you have to dodge the spikes at the top of the screen in later levels. Once you get used to it though, it's not bad really. It's not Tempest, but it's okay. But what is Tempest is the official release. Tempest by Electric Dreams, released in 1987. This is a 48k game, which is strange for 1987. Anyway, yep, this is Tempest alright. Sadly, because of the resolution, it's tricky to see the aliens when they first appear. So, you just end up flying around the outer edge, shooting like crazy. Once you get your eye in, this soon becomes a great game, and I spent far too long playing this when I should be reviewing it. The sound is average though, and it could have been so much better in my opinion. Control is fine, but you do have to get used to the fact that, like the arcade, when you press the button or move a joystick, you don't jump into the next grid. The player ship moves slightly before it actually swaps. There are different grids, or tunnels, and this really is a good version of the game, considering the resolution of the spectrum. The only thing I didn't like was the Super Zapper. It's a bit boring, really. Damn game, I can't stop playing it now. Okay, that's it. But is there any real point in claiming a winner here? We all know that the official release will be the best version, so... Oh well, just one more game then.
This is Headbangers Heaven, released by Llamasoft in 1983. Typically, Llamasoft produced weird and wacky games, and this one, as you can tell by the title, is no different. You control Chico the Headbanger, on a mission to collect money bags from the right hand side of the screen and take them across to the left. This task though is made difficult, due to the hammers that are continually falling down. However, you get points for being hit on the head, but not on the body. Don't try this at home folks. You have to keep an eye on your pain meter though. Every time you get hit, it goes up a notch, and if it gets too high, well, you know what the outcome of that's going to be. As it gets higher, you need to grab an aspirin, and these are in the form of impregnated red hammers. The more pain you are in, when you get this, the bigger the bonus will be. This game also uses the Stuart System's speech unit, that lets you hear Chico utter phrases such as ouch and my skull hurts. However, I couldn't find an emulator for this rare device. As you can see, the game is fairly simple. There are four barriers, but these soon get smashed away by the falling hammers. And because Chico flaps his arms about, it's very easy to get hit on the body, which loses you a life. Control can be sometimes sticky as well, and this can make it frustrating. sound is just a standard beep command, and collision can be a bit off as well. And sometimes I've moved underneath a hammer, but it still detected a body hit. The game is written in basic with machine code routines, and at the end of the game you get a ranking. I managed to make Barry Manilow, oh dear. A weird game, a simple game, and a game very much of its time, I think. This is Minder, released by DK Tronics in 1985. The game was written by coding legend Don Priestley before he made his name with those famous huge sprites in games like Benny Hill and Trapdoor. This game is based on the UK TV series, and you play Arthur Daly trying to make money from buying and selling goods, not all of them legitimate. To help him in this, he has a minder, a sort of bodyguard, called Terry. You are given 14 days to make as much cash as possible, starting off with just £2,000 and a few things in stock. The game has various locations familiar to anyone who watched the show, and these include the lockup, which is Arthur's storeroom, where you can store things and collect things to sell and buy. The Winchester Club, which is a pub, frequented by all the characters in the game, and Terry's Flat, where you can go and get him and tell him to do things like deliver certain items. There are other various locations for each of the dealers too. The game sets a real-world-like environment, in that dealers can open and close their shops and not be available to talk to. If this happens, you have two options. You can either go somewhere else, or wait, but either of those will waste an hour of time. One of the keys to the game is knowing when this happens. For example, no one will be at their location at 9pm. But if you want to see Waring, for example, you will find him open at 8am, 9am, 5pm, 6pm and 7pm. I suspect many people wrote down the times when playing this game. The game has a set of regular characters, but more can arrive as the game progresses. There is also the police, in the form of Sergeant Chisholm, and you best try and avoid him really. The game plays the theme tune at every opportunity, so it seems, and it soon gets very annoying. Luckily though, you can just press enter to move on quickly. 
All of the places are closed in the early hours of the morning, so you can visit your lockup and see the rather cheeky calendar on the wall. I'm sure many young boys were sniggering at that. You can then head off to find someone to sell your things to. I started off with some bunting and some garden gnomes. When you do find someone, you can press the number next to their head to start a conversation, and they may offer you things, and you can offer those things using a set number of phrases. And this is where the haggling comes in. They will offer you a very low price, you put in a higher price, and so on, until you reach something that works. If you do manage to buy something, you can ask Terry to collect it, and if you do sell something, you can ask him to deliver it as well. To be honest, this isn't my favourite style of game, but I can see the attraction. I know many people love this, trying to get a good price for things, seeing what people would offer, etc, etc. But for me, I'm sorry to say, it's just something I'd not come back to. The graphics are good, portraits are okay, the tune is annoying, but at the end of the day it's just a bartering game to see what the best prices you can get for the rather comically named items. One for the purists then. This is Witchweld, I think I pronounced that right, released in 2023 by Red Zebra. This is not a free game, but the price is worth it. You can get this wonderful 3D RPG for just £2, but obviously pay more to encourage such great work. Anyone familiar with games like Dungeon Master and Eye of the Beholder will recognise the format. Such a game on the spectrum is rare, and this is really superb. It works on 48k machines, but if you fire up your plus 2 or plus 3, you get music, additional portraits and extra dialogue. That's the best way to enjoy it. If you're running it on a Spectrum Next or other modern equivalent, you can speed up the game if you need to, and there are options in the game to adjust the music and dialogue speed. A nearby village has been attacked. You are rescued and joined by Kay, and together you head off in search of a missing scout. One of the many missions as the story unfolds. You walk around the land, shown in an impressive 3D view, and you also have a map at the bottom of the screen. Pressing the M key will show you a larger version of the map with the areas that you've found. You meet characters who you can talk to, and more often than not, groups of people that want to attack you. Somewhere you will locate some ruins, apparently this is where the scout is, so you have to go exploring. By this time, you would probably have had a few fights, and possibly found some better weapons, shields, and things to heal the party. The control system is good and logical, and the text and options are pretty self-explanatory and very easy to use. When you do meet someone, or a group, you can attack, defend, move your character around, or use an ability. I found myself lost in this world, exploring the landscape, levelling up the characters, and enjoying every second. The full walkthrough is over four hours, so I have hardly scratched the surface here. This is a fantastic game. I can't really praise it enough, just, just go and get it. In previous episodes, you saw me setting up a fictional business, 
ordering software, setting up stock control and getting some advertisements. With all these companies, I need some way to save and search for them. To keep track of contacts from places like distributors, magazines and stationery suppliers, I'm going to need a database. There are quite a few available, but again, I need one that works with the microdrive and subsequently the plus D. I looked at a few, including Data Genie, a nice menu-driven program that looks easy to use, and Plus AT Address Manager, another interesting program. Eventually, though, I settled for Master File. Now, to get this onto disk. The manual has a full page of instructions on how to do this. However, version 0.9, the one I have, seems to have all this in place. When you first load this, you get a few pages of text explaining that the program has extended features to run on microdrives. Excellent, but not needed, I think. You also get some information about changes to the manual due to this. Again, excellent, but again, not really needed. All you have to do is load the program from tape, select the Save option in the main menu, and select Microdrive, and it should all work. When you do this, this saves the basic program only. And to save the machine code, you have to select Exec User Basic and break into the program, and then you can dig around and find the save routine, which in this case is around the first few lines. Running this will save the machine code to the disk. And there you have it, it's all ready to go. Ah, it crashed, which is odd, because it loaded the file and also ran from tape. Hmm. So maybe I saved it out wrong. A second try and it crashed again. I tried a few different things and still it failed to load. And this is where I found something weird. Even in an emulator, if you load the main program, which then loads the code, it crashes. It only works if you load the small basic file before it that runs through the various options. But that file is just a load of print statements. So after a lot of messing about, I copied that to disk and still it crashed. I really did try everything to get this working. My last hope then was the snapshot button on the plus D interface. This seemed to go okay. I saved and loaded a test file and that seemed to work as well. Right, let's try using it then. When it first loads, the program uses an existing data file as a demo, so we need to clear that. To erase this and start with an empty database, we have to press R from the main menu. This is the option to reset. Then, according to the manual, I have to invert the selection and then press P to purge. I have no idea what most of that means, but I do like the actual key commands, which are R, I and P. Anyway, we get a prompt confirm. We then have to clear a few more things. We have to erase the data formats and the display settings. To do this, we go through various functions in the menu that's all laid out in the manual. Uh, very confusing. Eventually, though, we have a blank database, which we should save to disk. This is easily done. And now we are really ready to start using the program. First, we need to set up some field references and names to hold our data. And like all good databases, it's best to write down what's needed before you begin. I'll need a name field, a company field, an address field, a telephone number field, and an account field. Not too complex, you'd have thought. Right, from the main menu, you have to press N to go to the data reference menu. Then A to add an item, and then we need to enter what's called a reference, which is a single letter. So, for example, A will mean the account field. And now I do the same for all the others. N for name, C for company, L for address, and T for telephone. And that's the data file set up. Now I can add some data. To do this, I press A, and then A again, uh, and I'm asked for a reference, so to add an account, I press A. And then you go through it all again for the other references. N for name, C for company, etc, etc. And after each record, I have to go back to the main menu, and then hit A again to start a new entry. It all seems a very long process, but after six or seven times, it becomes a little bit easier once you get used to it. Eventually, I get a few data items in there. 
but we can't actually view them yet. We have to build a report or display first. If you thought adding data was complex, you ain't seen nothing yet. You can build reports or displays that are quite complex, adding labels to data items, different colors, flashing elements, and even boxes. It's best to plan things out before you try. There's not much about how you do this in the manual, so you have to sort of work your way through it. There is a small exercise in the book, which is really good, and I use this quite a lot. Initially, you'd need to work out where you want the data items to be displayed on screen, and in what size print. You can have 32, 42, or 51 column printing. Now here's my basic plan. I just want to show the account number, business name, and telephone number. So let's begin. I think I'll try 42 columns. I'll give the report a name using the label. And now I can add the reference to A, which is account at line two and column zero. Next is the company name at line two, column 10. And then finally the telephone number at line two, column 30. With all that done, I can actually see what it looks like. Not too bad, and usable. Now for something a little bit more complex. Again, using 42 columns, I set out various lines and columns for each data item. And after a lot of failure and messing about, I have this display. You can have different reports and quickly select them from the main menu. And while viewing, you have various options as well, including the ability to print. You can move forwards and backwards through each item and each page of items, and you can do a search. Now this is in place, I'll save everything to disk. Now I can use the database when I need it. So for example, if I want to search for someone, let's say I know a contact called Harry, but I can't remember which company he worked for, I can go to the main menu, select S to search, select character and string, type in Harry, and you'll notice at the bottom it will say selection equals one. That means it's found one record that matches that search. And then you can press D to display it. And there it is, there's Harry. Now then, what about printing? Let's give it a try. I reselect all the data items, display the first batch on screen, and press P. And ah, nothing happens. Interesting. I'm suspecting that the program uses the copy command, which is incompatible with the plus the interface. Either that or there's something else amiss that's stopping it from printing. Oh dear. Not that I really want to print anything out from a database, it's more of a record keeping and search facility. Right. Mm. Oh well. With that done, pretend orders are now starting to arrive. So next month it's time to dispatch, reduce stock and print some invoices. This is Rapides, released by Vision Software in 1983, and I think you can guess what type of game this is. Yes, it's a centipede clone. You get the usual mushrooms, centipede, spiders and snails, and although the movement is in character squares, the game is quite playable. When mushrooms are one character above the player, the shooting sound does not trigger, that's because the sound is based on the position of the projectile that you shoot, which doesn't actually appear when shooting things one square up. That's the only sound effect in the game apart from when you get killed, so the centipede movement blips of the arcade are missing. The centipede, when it gets to the bottom of the screen, begins to move back up, and things can get pretty busy at this point, especially if the spider also makes an appearance. The explosions when you hit something are nice, but could do with a nice sound effect to go with them. 
Once you clear the first centipede, there's no colour change with the mushrooms either, but the game gets progressively harder. Also making it harder is the fact that you can't just hold down the fire button, you have to keep stabbing at it. It's not a bad version of the arcade classic, especially for 16k.